Hello, this is the fourth in a series of screencasts on the topic of the chemistry of acids and bases for the module CHE 1063. Okay, so today what we're going to do is we're going to move away from the calculations we've been doing so far on um, bronsted lowry acids and we're going to move to a slightly more descriptive way of thinking. Okay, so in terms of today, we're going to talk about aqua acids, hydroxyl acids and oxo acids. We'll talk about what these are and actually we will be doing some estimation or prediction of their peak. KAs. Um, okay, um, reading for this uh, associated reading is all from inorganic chemistry and I have put QR codes which link directly to the BibliU um, website um, throughout the slides, so please go there. But basically the section starts at about 157, page 157 and goes through to about 161 I think. Okay, so let's start with a few definitions of what these types of acids are. Now, the key point on this slide is that all of these different types of acids have this kind of OHX group attached to a central atom, okay? So the central atom in this case is aluminium, here it's tellurium, and here it is sulfur, okay? And then depending on what the group that's attached is, that will give us uh, what type of acid it is. So if the group attached and if X is equal to two, um, then you have an aqua acid and basically what this is is um, a metal cation that has been dissolved into water and because the metal cation has a high positive charge the polar oxygen on H2O um, is forming a sort of weak bond with that um, positive charged cation okay or with that strongly positively charged cation Okay. Now, the stronger that bond is actually leads to the weakening of the HO bonds. And so when you go from an aqua acid and if you make a particularly strong bond between the oxygen and um, that central atom, you get a hydroxo acid because basically one of the H's um, from that um, water group um, essentially dissociates and you get left with an OH group and that happens um, in all cases. So a hydroxo acid, um, you know, the difference here is of course we have um, hydroxy groups as opposed to, you know, water groups on the outside um, or hydroxo groups. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's an extreme version of an aqua acid. And, and actually, you can see the same thing for an oxo acid. If you then go and lose one of these protons, then you end up with two bonds to the central metal at atom and you end up with oxo groups, which is this double bond O. OK, the way in which these behave as acids is, um, you know, relatively sensible. It's the same as we've been going through before. An acid is a proton donor. So essentially the way that, for example, an aqua acid would behave as an acid is you would lose one of the protons on one of the water groups. OK, so, you know, maybe this one dissociates and gives OH and plus, you know, H3O plus when it reacts with water. OK, and likewise for sulfuric acid, you're going to lose um, one um, one of your hydrogens. Um, you know, that's going to um, dissociate to give um, this whole species here um, with an O minus and H3O plus. Yeah. OK. And the same for the middle one. So you can kind of do that in exactly the same way as we've done already. Um, you can write out this in this case for the aqua acid um, plus H2O is in equilibrium with H3O plus plus this species here, which obviously has lost a positive charge because you've lost um, one of those positive charges through losing a proton to um, associate with the water. OK, um, so they react in exactly the same way, basically, as you've covered already. OK. Now, within that general category of different types of acids, there is a very specific one, which is a mononuclear oxo acid. And in this case, what you have is an acidic proton on a hydroxyl OH, you know, group, um, which then is going to be attached to the um, the um, the parent at, um, element, which is in this case sulfur, phosphorus. So this parent element more generally can be referred to as E, capital E, and that parent element has at least one oxo group attached to it because otherwise it wouldn't be an oxo acid. Okay, so the, the mononuclear bit is basically saying there's just one parent element. So all of these would be examples of mononuclear oxo acids, and all of these parent elements are going to be in high oxidation states. So you know we're going to talk about oxidation states as part of redox chemistry, but you know you might already be able to do this. Um, in the case of sulfur, for example, we're talking about a plus six oxidation state. Okay. 
Again, the general form of dissociation is a dissociation in exactly the same way as we've seen already. Um, but this looks a bit more complicated because we've got kind of, you know, strange letters in it. But this is just essentially, um, you know, the parent element. So, you know, for sulfuric acid, that would be an S. Then you have the number of oxo groups. So in this case, we've got two oxo groups. So X would be two. And you've got the number of hydroxyl groups. So in this case, you know, this Y would also be two for sulfuric acid. Again, that reacts with H2O and all that happens is you obviously reduce the number of oxo, um, hydroxo groups by one and you increase and you have basically an OH O minus that's left over. And of course you make um, your H3O plus um, at the same time. Now within this bracket, of course, you don't always have to have an OH um, as the other group. So for example, if you have your, again, sulfuric acid and you have one of your OHs, so you're always going to need one because you've got to have a dissociable proton, obviously. But if you change the other group from an OH to an F, for example, so to a fluorine, then this will have an effect on the strength of that acid. Okay. Now, and this is because basically if you put an, a fluorine here, and you've essentially exchanged that for an oxygen that's attached to a hydrogen, yeah? The fluorine is a more electronegative element, so the electrons are pulled from the sulfur towards the fluorine um, more in a more strong manner or more strongly than they would have been done when oxygen was there. Now, if they're coming from the sulfur, um, obviously sulfur is in a high oxidation state, so it hasn't got a lot of oxygen to donate. So they've got to come from somewhere else. OK, so they're going to be coming from the oxygens that surround the sulfur. Yeah. So essentially what, what we can do here is we can think of an arrow that's being drawn basically along the lines of this. You know, we've got an arrow which is drawn this way, you know, towards the fluorine. OK, in this molecule. Now, if it's coming from the um, the sort of um, the, the oxo groups, it, it, it doesn't really matter so much. But of course, it's also going to come from the group that's got the hydrogen. Now, of course, you can also draw that group as this, um, you know, instead of having a hydrogen here. And in this case, you've, of course, got an arrow going this way, too. So the electrons from the OH bond are going to be pulled towards the fluorine because all of the electrons in the molecule are coming towards the fluorine more than they would be if it was just an OH. OK, now, if the electrons are being pulled away from the hydrogen, um, you know, and this bond is already not going to be um, centered around the hydrogen. It's going to be centered around the oxygen because the oxygen is going to hold its electrons more strongly than the hydrogen is. So, you know, that's only going to weaken that bond. OK, and so ultimately the effect of changing an OH to a fluorine is to weaken the OH bond here um, at the end of the molecule. And in doing so, what we're doing is we're making a stronger acid. And so actually this one here, as I've noted down here, is actually a super acid. OK. Now, you can do the exact same thing if you put instead of a, a you know, an electron withdrawing group like fluorine or, or CF3, if you put an electron donating group. So, you know, NH2, it's got a lone pair. We could actually explicitly put it in. You've got your lone pair here and that can effectively sort of donate back towards the um, towards the sulfur. It doesn't form a bond. It doesn't actually sort of donate all the way. So we're not going to use a, a proper curly arrow to represent this. This arrow is just representing the fact that there is some electrons that come in the direction of the sulfur. And of course, you know, if the electrons are coming in the direction of the sulfur, then what you're going to have is you're going to have this kind of general movement towards, again, the oxygen that's got the hydrogen attached to it. If the oxygen is slightly more electron dense, then it's got the more ability to allow the hydrogen to have more electrons. That strengthens that OH bond and it decreases the strength of the acid. So yeah, basically the groups you've got attached to that central parent atom, if they're not OH, will make a difference to the strength of that acid. Okay. When it comes to oxo acids, when it's just basic parent oxo acids, um, we can actually estimate the pKa of these things um, using something which is known as Pauling's rules. OK, now there's two rules here. So and we, we're going to talk in general terms because this applies to all oxo acids. OK, so again, you know, this is our parent element. This is our number of oxo groups, a number of double bond O's. This is our number of OH groups. OK. And the first rule is basically that pKa1 is equal to 8 minus 5x. So x is the number of oxo groups. Okay. 
Rule number two is essentially that if you have another OH group, which you know you often do for an oxo acid, if you have a second OH group, then you have a second pKa because that other OH group can also deprotonate. Um, and in that case, the, the second pKa will be five more than the first pKa. So we can write that down here. So you know pKa2 is equal to pKa1 plus five. Okay. And incidentally, this whole thing about there being a pKa2 and a pKa1, you know, this just, you know, for some of these um, types of acids, we'll have many, many pKa's, you know, all the way until every single hydrogen is is dissociated. Now, you would expect that to become harder each time, of course, and you might want to think about why that is. Of course, it's going to be somehow to do with the fact that the molecule becomes already charged and it's hard to take a positive charge away from a, a more positively charged species. Um, but but yeah, um, you know, this 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 is to be expected. But Palling's rules basically give a number to that difference. OK. So let's just do a quick worked example um, of the use of these rules. And I'm going to choose um, sulfuric acid for this. And we know this is a strong acid. So in principle, the pKa, you know, should should end up being um, a negative number or at least it should be less than zero, shouldn't it? OK, so first step, we need to basically write out our acid um, in terms of um, in, in the sort of more general terms. So we normally write sulfuric acid as H2SO4, um, but we need to write it as, you know, with the number of oxo groups and the number of OH groups, okay? So the first thing we need to do is determine what E is, and of course, for sulfuric acid, it's sulfur. The second thing is we can rewrite it in our general form. So, you know, what we would normally write as H2SO4 becomes S, O2, OH2. Yeah, so here we can see, therefore, that X is equal to 2. And of course, if you can draw out sulfuric acid again, you can see again that the number of oxo groups is equal to 2. So you maybe didn't need to do the, the sort of the first two steps if you already knew what the structure was. If we know what the number of oxo groups is, and of course we've said that's 2, we can put that into that first formula to find what pKa1 is. So this is the um, pKa1 is the dissociation, acid dissociation constant for that first dissociation. So the parent molecule losing the first hydrogen, this one here. Okay, and in this case, we get an estimation of pKa as being minus two, which, you know, makes sense because we know sulfuric acid is a strong acid. Okay, and of course, then we can estimate pKa2. And then we learn that basically once sulfuric acid has already dissociated into an O-minus OH, uh, an O minus here, um, then the other OH group is not a strong acid. It's a weak acid. OK, so in other words, the um, um, the, the base, uh, the conjugate base of sulfuric acid is actually a weak acid. OK, if that makes any sense. And that has a pKa equals three. OK, so, you know, hopefully you can do that now for any acids. OK, and this is certainly something I'm going to get you to try to do in the in the quiz. Okay. Key point on um, Pauling's rules uh, in terms of accuracy um, is that they are actually pretty decent for many mononuclear oxo acids. OK, so, you know, uh, and that's basically where we've just got one parent element and you've got that general formula that I said already. But of course, when you start substituting in different groups, as we said, so if I start putting a CF3 group on in, in place of one of those OHs, or if I put a, a um, an amine group on in place of one of those OHs, that that prediction is not going to be accurate anymore. And at that point in time, the way to explain the difference um, between the predictive value and the, the value you end up getting experimentally is, is by the sort of electron withdrawing or donating effects that we talked about already. OK, there are other exceptions, too, that don't come under that bracket. So, for example, we've got this one here, which is carbonic acid. And OK, carbonic acid, you get an experimental pKa1 of 6.4 and Pauling's rules would predict on the basis of the um, there only being one oxo group because, you know, two of them are going to be OHs. Um, Pauling's rule predict three of the pKa. So this is quite a big discrepancy. I worked it out to be in about two and a half thousand. OK, and the same discrepancy applies for pKa2, albeit not as drastically. Now, this is not to do with the fact that, you know, um, carbonic acid is substituted. Um, it is actually to do with um, equilibria that exist when carbonic acid is in solution. OK, so, you know, when carbonic acid is in solution it's in com competition with dissolved co2 and because of the presence of this dissolved co2 um, the experimental value that is quoted for pKa1 tends to be too low okay um, and actually when you take into account the dissolved co2 um, as is noted in the inorganic chemistry textbook um, you get a pKa value of about 3.6 which is much closer to Pauling's rules so all is not lost 
The final point to be made on the subject of Pauling's rule um, is basically that you can you often obviously will often get the same pKa for two acids. So for example, if you have no oxo groups, you always get a pKa of six because x is equal to zero and eight minus zero is eight. Yeah. Um, so sorry, you always get a predicted pKa of eight, not six. You can clearly see it says eight. Okay. Now. But yet you would expect to get different pKa's for these two acids, for example, and that's because the two metal um, metal atoms in elements in the center are um, metal ions, obviously, are in different oxidation states. OK, now tellurium's in an oxidation state of plus six here. And so the pKa is lower um, than for silicon, which is in a lower oxidation state. And you can just basically see that as, you know, if this tellurium is in a higher oxidation state, um, again, just as with those electron withdrawing effects that we were talking about already, the bonds, uh, the, the, the sort of electrons from the oxygen are being pulled more strongly towards the tellurium in the center um, and because of that you know that weakens the OH bond in a in a stronger matter you know it, it weakens the OH bond more essentially than the silicon which is in a slightly lower oxidation state okay and so that will again obviously have an effect on pKa and the general principle is of course that the higher oxidation state you've got for the central atom the stronger acid you've got